Aloha. Good morning. It's June the 1st, 2022. Thank you for joining us for American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Epichel, your host, and today's title is A Voting Rights Bill, A Distant Memory. And before I go into the topic, I'd like to introduce our guests. Our special guest today is Jane Sugamora. My co-host is Jay Fidel, and of course, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning Kim. Jay, um, you know, we have over since really 2020, uh, since the election uh, uh, that Donald Trump lost and President Biden won, uh, we've had a number of states in the country immediately pass what we would term as voter suppression bills. And I guess of all these voter suppression bills, what seems to be the most troubling aspect in your mind to what's been passed? And, and I'll ask this question later to probably Jane, but does it really, really have an impact on voter turnout? And will it really matter that these, these states have passed these voter suppression bills? Only if the Democrats win the popular vote, then it'll matter. If the Republicans win, they won't say boo. Uh, there was a piece in the paper the other day about that, about some of these Trump candidates who won. And uh, they didn't say anything about, um, you know, the possibility of voter fraud or irregularities at the polls. It's a one-way street, this kind of thing, these bills, these suppression bills. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the insurrection was plan A, you know, denying the uh, transfer of power. Um, it's, it, and it's critical. It goes to the heart of democracy. But uh, Plan B is this uh, this voting thing. And what I find interesting is that we are not paying as much attention. There was no violence, you know, in in all these bills. It's just votes by Republicans and Republican legislators with Republican governors around the country. <clears throat> and um, it doesn't attract as much attention as an insurrection does. But in fact, it's much more dangerous because. Um, you know, they, they, will, they will muck up this election. And I don't necessarily mean that they will, um, you know, uh, win the popular vote or that there's stuff in there that is calculated to win the popular vote. It's that two things. One is that they reserve the right to turn things over by way of an elected or, you know, managed secretary of state. And the second thing, and this is really important, is confusion, confusion about the about what's at stake, about the ballot, about going down, not going down, uh, confusion about um, interpreting the results, confusion that will leak into the media, and before you know it, the, the news and thus public opinion will will be festooned with all this confusion. I mean, it's really dangerous because if you can say that you know an insurrection and denying transfer of power is plan A. The plan B is not far behind. Um, voting is, think about it, you know, this is representative government, a republic. Um, if, you, if you don't have voting and you don't have confidence in voting and clarity in voting and a lack of ambiguity in how it works and what it does, um, you cannot perform the constitutional duties of a republic, a democracy. So, you know, what bothers me most is that these secretaries, these phony baloney secretaries of state have the power to turn it over. Not only that they do, but they might, and that will create confusion uh, in the mind of the media and the public. All right. I'm going to follow up on that last point. Uh, Jane, uh, good morning and welcome. See, Jane, um, Jane has mentioned secretaries of state. In a lot of these voter suppression bills, um, there seems to be an aspect of the appointment of, of if you will, bipart not bipartisan, but a partisan appointees versus a public elected official for Secretary of State. To what degree is that a concern? And, and would that actually, can we show a correlation that that would somehow hamper uh, the fair and free election of any state? I think that, uh, you know, I agree with, with Jay. I think if you, you, you appoint, you know, and you make it partisan, uh, you're, it, it, you're going to have somebody in there uh, who will take advantage uh, of a situation, especially you know, if, if, it's, if it's a Republican and the Republicans are losing, you're going to have you know, uh, somebody in there. Uh, I think it, it, it takes away from the trustworthiness. It, it should be a nonpartisan person who is in control of these elections. And to, to me, 
uh, you know, until you know what, what Trump started spreading the great lie or whatever, I didn't realize that there were people in the state government who could somehow set aside these elections. You know, it didn't it didn't occur to me that there was a person who could do that. And apparently, uh, in some states, uh, that's happening. And, and to me, that's frightening. That is really frightening. Yeah, it is. And I guess you know we're we're looking at two bills that have passed the House: uh, the John R. Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, and then the Voting Rights Bill. Um, excuse me, the uh, the Freedom to Vote Act. I think uh, Amy Klobuchar uh, sponsored that bill in the House. Uh, you know, those seem to be a national fix for some of these concerns that we have. But failing that, failing their passage in the Senate, what, what do you think uh, can be done to correct these uh, individual state bills that seem to be uh, voter suppression bills? I think we're going to have to uh, really start educating the voters. I mean, they're going to have to take back their country. And, you know, people, and, and, and the, the problem is, is you have a lot of apathy. You know, I've been involved in a lot of campaigns. And, you know, people just figure, oh, well, you know, my vote doesn't count. You know, why should I go and vote? And what we're seeing, I think, in a lot of these elections, that you know, every vote does count. And even if your candidate candidate doesn't win, it's important, you know, to go out and at least voice your choice and vote, you know, to express your choice for issues and for candidates who support certain issues. Because otherwise, you know, our you know, our democracy is just gonna just go away. I like to hit on that point, voter apathy. Does does it help that the media is is communicating that these states have implemented these these voter suppression elements in their state law? And would that discourage voters from saying, you know, it's a free and fair election, so I'll just stay home? Do you think there's any correlation to uh, how the voters view what these bills are or are not? Well, and you know, Cynthia's going to talk about what they are in about a minute. No, but you know what I think is you know, and and I, I look at this as you know, um, uh, part of the the Democratic, uh, you know, party uh, that you know has to go out and work with the community. And you know, to me, if I lived in one of those states, that would mean that I'd have to work harder to educate, you know, our my constituency, my group, to say, hey, they pass these laws. And so this means that we, we got to do certain things differently and we got to do it because if we don't, we're going to lose the right to vote. And I think that's, that's frightening. Amen. Yeah. Good point. Cynthia, I know you have a, a long list of uh, those states which have passed what I would consider some voter suppression elements. Uh, why don't you go down to some of the top, top states? Uh, I'm thinking Florida, Georgia. Um, Montana, Texas, those kind of states. And why don't you go ahead and uh, describe some of the suppression elements that have passed in these states? Well, I think it's important first to realize that there's two actually classifications of these bills. There's restrictive bills, right, that are restricting the right to vote. Those are deadline for absentee ballots is sooner. Absentee ballots need to be notarized. Uh, eliminating mail return and drop boxes eliminating senior exemptions for, you know, uh, absentee ballots, uh, stopping the black churches, Sunday voting souls to the polls things. They're closing them on Sunday. Is that real? Is that real? It is very real. Uh, that's in Georgia and it's already happened. Uh, clearing the voter rolls, ID laws, and then making it harder to register. Now those are the restrictive bills. Okay. Overall lawmakers, have in 39 states have considered 393 restrictive bills for the 22 legislative session. And since 2021, 18 states have passed 34 restrictive voting laws that disproportionately affect people of color. So okay. then we've got, okay, we've got the, um, the overall lawmakers in, in 27, uh, states introduced 148 election interference bills in the 22 legislative session. And those are the ones, like what Jane was just talking about, that actually um, give them 
of the ability to change what the votes are when they come in, if they don't like the results. They've increased the ability for people to be um, criminally charged. It's going to be federal offenses if you do anything that doesn't exactly follow these new laws. So even if it's a mistake, you can still be charged um, with a federal no, state states cannot create federal crimes, Cynthia. It would have to be a state crime. State crime. Sorry, I I didn't mean to say federal. I meant to say uh, uh, not just a misdemeanor, right? But it's actually criminal. Felony. Felony. I meant to say criminal. Thank you for that correction. So um, we've got six states that have already passed election interference laws, and that's what's scary. We've got you know. 27 states that are still looking at 148 other bills, but there are six that have already passed. Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, and Oklahoma have already passed those laws. Yeah. And that's what, to me, I'm with Jane. That's the scariest part. You know, the restriction stuff is one thing. We can overcome that by getting more people out to the polls, by getting more, you know, uh, people informed about what's happening. But these, these other ones, you know, these election interference bills, those are the ones that are so scary because it takes the, it takes the power out of the voters' hands. All right. Uh, Jay, you know, I'm looking at the John R. Lewis bill and the Freedom to Vote Act. And I don't know, it just sometimes seems to me that, and I hate to pin this on Democrats, but when we come to the table with a bill, I'm thinking of Build Back Better, that was originally a couple trillion, more than that. Um, we seem to come in with the entire kitchen sink. Uh, for example, the John R. Lewis bill, you know, there's a whole concept about reworking how gerrymand ger gerrymandering is, 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 is accomplished. Uh, that's an issue that's been tried to have been tackled for, you know, decades. I mean, gerrymandering has been taking place for hundreds of years in this country. Um, is it too much? Are these federal bills asking too much, and that's why they can't get passed? I mean, well, yeah, should, yes. it be broken, should it be broken down like uh, they're proposing with Build Back Better? Is break it down in smaller chunks, you know, so that you can get this stuff passed with some bipartisan agreement. That's that's one of the problems. I mean, I, I think the major problem, you know, uh, Cynthia articulated a bunch of systems, a bunch of techniques of you know draconian methodologies that the republicans have thought of and a lot of those are in the last six or eight months right mm -hmm. okay and and i think they're designed to get around the voting rights bill uh, the john lewis bill and the freedom to vote act um it, which were never well drafted okay they were never really strong enough to do the job anyway but the Republicans have been working on bills that respond to those provisions, okay, and get around them. So, uh, I mean, even if those bills pass right now today, remember, they've been sitting there in, in the hopper for a year or more, right? And, and they, they haven't wrapped around the Republican approach, the Republican attacks. Uh, they're sitting pretty before being useless. And, and, you know, I worry about that. Everybody has this thing on their mind. Well, we have a voting rights bill. It's going to fix everything. I'm here to tell you it's not going to fix everything. No. It's not all that well drafted. It was not drafted to really address the problem at the outset. And it certainly hasn't wrapped around the problem as the problem has evolved in so many states, including battleground states. Uh, so I, I don't think it's, a, you know, a solution. A, I don't think it's a, a cure-all. Um, and furthermore, I mean, that actually doesn't matter because I'm here to tell you that those bills are never, ever going to pass. We will never have voting rights. Okay, I want to make one other point. May I have one other point? May I make one other point? Of course. Yesterday. You're, you're on, my co-host. <laughs> yesterday on NPR was a very, 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 very interesting program about two sociologist um, database guys. And I think it was in Stanford, who looked into the level of violence in the country before and after Roe v. Wade. And I think Cynthia can tell us, and Jane can tell us, that Roe v. Wade dampened violence in this country. 
Why? Because there weren't so, so many unwanted children. Unwanted children engage in crime. Unwanted children are loose, um, you know, on following the rules. They don't have good parenting. They're not wanted. Okay, so over the past 50 years, we've seen a, diminish, a diminishing amount of crime because of this. Now you can say, where do you get that, Fidel? Well, the answer is these guys did a very smart uh, database analysis of crime and abortion since Roe v. Wade. Really, really interesting. Who could have figured that this would have happened in 1973? Nobody. Nobody would have figured that th this would be a result of that Supreme Court case. Okay? So what I'm saying is that we have to look forward, just like those guys would have done had they been there thinking the same thoughts in 1973. Okay? So <clears throat> if, if, you know, if we have good voting rights, there are all kinds of implications for the country. It goes beyond who wins that election. It goes beyond uh, you know, racial justice. It goes beyond social or economic justice. It's all of those things. Okay? And likewise, if we have no voting rights, as Jane says, we are ultimately going to lose our democracy. There will be some terrible changes for the lack of voting rights, just like there will be some terrible changes in crime for the lack of Roe v. Wade. You have to look down the passage. You have to see it 10, 20, 30, even 50 years from now. So the changes the Republicans have made don't stop in November of 2022, nor do they stop in, in uh, November of 2024. They go on. They're not going to be so easily reversed. And the lack of voting rights is going to be with us for a long time. It is going to change the country and our lives. We can't figure out right now, but I'm telling you, it will happen. Oh, yeah. All righty, Jay, thank you. I'm reminded also that we have to look at Dr. Spock and his philosophy of being allowing our children to be so permissive and not uh, stunt their growth of emotional well-being. <laughs> All right, uh, Jane, <laughs> I, di I digress. Uh, Jane, you know, I'm looking at Florida Bill 90 or Georgia Senate Bill 202, and a lot of these have a common thread to them, and that is voter identification. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with uh, expecting a state to verify someone's ability and um, the privilege to vote? I, I know it's a right, but if you are, you know, um, a lot, you know, if you're not, say, you're not uh, registered to vote, what's wrong with asking for identification? You, you mean like a photo identification? Or state ID or a driver's license? Yes. What? Is there anything wrong with that? I think they, they they do it as a matter of course, but you know when you when you think about it, you know the people who are homeless and the people you know who are disadvantaged, uh, they probably don't have the wherewithal uh, to have a photo ID. They don't have a driver's license because they don't have cars, and you know, um, and so it does discriminate. Yeah, uh, it is it, it is discriminatory. Uh, well, let me let me address that because you know. A lot of Democrats, Democrats say exactly what you just stated. And I guess the question is, why can't we have a national um, effort to set aside funds for those who can't afford a state ID, who are you know, indigent and, or, or cannot, um, certainly don't have the ability to drive, so they don't have a driver's license? Why can't we assist those who, you know, and preserve their rights to vote with some kind of, um, I don't know, a, a fund of one type or another? to assist them in that effort. Well, you know, when, when you're talking about the homeless too, I mean, how do you give a, a, a photo ID to somebody who doesn't have a home and, you know, who, who, you know, who, who doesn't have an address? Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, uh, and, you know, th that's a problem. And, uh, and for, you know, for people uh, who are in that situation, uh, it, it disenfranchises them and, um, and, you know, and, and, to me, uh, that's discriminatory, uh, and so you, because of your socioeconomic level, uh, because of you know your lack of resources, you're denied the right to vote, and that's just not right. Okay, that's that's the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, one other question is, you know, we have a lot of things in the headline, be it Roe v. Wade or the Texas shooting or the Buffalo, New York shooting. Uh, we have all these things that are, are gaining the attention of Americans in the headlines. Certainly, Ukraine's part of that. 
Uh, to what degree should voter suppression bills before the midterms elections, should that be kind of rise to the top again? Or do you think it will? I, I, I am concerned that they will. I think, you know, as you indicated to me, I, I, I'm looking at, you know, um, the, the, what is it, the, the Texas massacre. And it, again, it occurs to me, why would an 18 year old need an assault rifle in this country? I mean, it's the stupidest. I mean, to me, I mean, it, that, to, to me, that just begs the question, we need to stop this. We need to stop people, you know, an 18 year old from going out and getting an assault rifle, because what do you do with an assault rifle? You don't do it. You don't use it for hunting. You don't use it for protection. You use it to kill people. And so why would why would you sell uh, an assault rifle to an 18 year old? And, you know, this has got to stop. And I think I and it, and it disturbs me that people are more upset about it because it's not like this. Is Haven't we become thing. numb to it? I hope not. I hope not. I mean, that's clearly that seems to be the case where hardly anyone's really talking about it in social circles. We see it on the news, but aren't we just tired of the umpteen shootings that uh, seems to be commonplace? But I think that's why somebody has to kind of step up and and demand that something gets done. And you know, and and I think that you know we are reaching that point where people are you know shaking their heads and saying, you know, something's got to be done. This can't keep happening. Well, I mean, on the same vein is voter suppression issues that have been passed, um, is that now become a nothing burger because we're just completely desensitized to <clears throat> what's going on? Yeah, you know, I, I, that's what I'm concerned about because every time I hear about one of these bills passing, I'm thinking, you know, what, what, what's happening in that state? Where are the, you know, thinking people, you know, who care about, you know, equality and, 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 uh, the, the, you know, the right to vote. Where are those people when these laws are getting passed in their state? You know, it, that just, you know, really bothers me that, that, you know, that there's this silent group of people who aren't saying things so that the, these voter suppression bills can be passed in those states. Right. All right. Thank you. Hey, Cynthia, um, you know, I saw your correspondence regarding this issue and certainly that um, voter suppressions have lost the headlines. To your, to your um, recommendation, what should be done to bring it back up to our recognition of, of this country and the voters in this country? How do we do that? How do we get this thing back on the radar screen? Well, unfortunately, the people in Congress are the ones who have to do that. And they're not, because now they're busy with gun legislation that's never going to pass, ever. I agree we need to do something. I agree something should be done. Uh, what Texas governor just re, he um, rolled it back. It used to be 21 to get one of those rifles, and now it's 18. There's no background checks. You don't need a permit to carry in Texas. So, yeah, how we're going to roll that back right now between now and November is silly because we're not. That's a years long process, I'm sure. So what's the answer to the concern about voter suppression? What is, what is the solution? Because we know we have two national bills that aren't going anywhere, thanks to Joe Manchin and his inability to adjust or modify a filibuster. So if the two national bills aren't going anywhere, um, where do we go? I, I'm not sure where we can go, but we know it's bad because these bills where they, you know, can uh, bias election reviews and all this other partisan stuff that's going on, they've already been studied and they are absolutely, they lack transparency, they fail to satisfy basic security, accuracy and reliability measures. So how is it that they're allowed to go forward? We know that the Supreme Court, you know, has already gutted the, you know, John Lewis, Voting Rights Act, both uh, Section 2 and Section 5 were struck down by the su Supreme Court, and one in 2013, and then one again in 2021. So we don't have the courts on our side. All we can hope is that every court in every state is just going to flood the court system with nothing but challenges to these bills, 
And unless we do that in the states that this is happening in, it's not going to happen. You know, one of the state representatives in Arizona, he's quoted as saying, we need to get back to the 1958 style of voting. I mean, let, yeah, let's go back to a different century. Why not? Let's well, you, <laughs> you can stand in line and, and not have in mail-in ballots or anything. Okay, great. Paper ballots that are hand canceled. That's what he wants. Great. <laughs> And then, you know, I would just say one more thing, if it's okay. Sure. I think this is really important when we're talking about people being disenfranchised because of ID voter laws. Um, the biggest people that are going to be disenfranchised because of that is the American Indians. I mean, our, our Native Americans are the ones, they don't have addresses. They don't have, you know, regular places where they can go for IDs. And here, Arizona had just passed not too long ago, I think it was 2018, I don't remember the exact number now, um, where they passed something saying that um, they were gonna be able to get around that, right? They were gonna give more la latitudes to the Native Americans in Arizona. And then all these new bills that are being passed in Arizona, take all of it right back away again. All of it's gone. So I think that the, you know, we think of people of color automatically right and then there's going to be a new thing in most of these states also where you have to prove citizenship <laughs> yeah so if you've been you know a hispanic that's been living see even if you're second generation but if you don't have your little slip that says you are a citizen then you know they're going to make you find it go get it and present it before they'll let you vote you know, that's a Texas bill, and I think the Brennan Legal Center is actually challenging that in court. Um, so that is a proposal, but it is being challenged. So good point. Good for it's you to bring that up. To flood the courts at this point. That is our only hope, to talk about it nonstop. Tell all of the people that you know in the media to stop talking 24-7 about the same thing and start getting so they can actually talk about maybe two or three subjects. They got an hour. We go through three or four in our half hour sometimes. They can start doing that instead of just this nonstop bombarding every, every single day, 24 seven has been nothing but Uvalde. Now, granted, it's a horrible thing that happened, but why not throw in some gun rights stuff in there? Why not talk about some voting rights and how it will affect the gun rights? And, but they don't. So I think the media are just as much to blame. Yeah. I agree. All right. You know, I think we're coming uh, to the end of our time for this program, but I want to go around the table and ask for your final thoughts. But um, before I do that, Jay, to Jane's point that now more than ever that there needs to be get out the vote, an education for, for voters, that uh, the, the system might be slightly stacked against them now that they weren't back in 2020. Uh, is that the approach that's going to win the day? Uh, more motivation? And is it wedge issues that get people out to the voting booths or to their you know, mail-in ballots? Is it Roe v. Wade? Is it gun uh, reform? Are those issues uh, certainly going to mo motivate or not motivate uh, people to get engaged in 2022 midterms? Good question. And, uh, you know, to trip on what Jane was saying, it seems to me that... Um, Republicans are never going to do that, right? They would like to undermine voting. They don't want voting. It's horrible. Um, God will get them for that. But <clears throat> their own God. Um, but, you know, the, the Democrats could. And the problem is the Democrats are in fragmentation now. Uh, I, I don't think a Democratic uh, Party ha has a leader that we can recognize uh, who gets up and and, and talks that kind of rhetoric and says, you've got to get out there and voting and vote uh, and tries to dispel the confusion because uh, I was going to make the point in my closing remarks that uh, we are going to have enormous confusion in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you have confusion, people say, the hell with this. I'm not going to vote. I'm out of here. Not worth it. Doesn't count. Um, so somebody's got to straighten all that out. Somebody's got to tell them, don't be confused. Here's the rules. Here's what you do. Um, and, and remember to vote, just like Jane said. But you've got to have somebody uh, in a position of leadership and authority say that. And right now, I would say the Democratic Party nationally, the DNC, hasn't done that. 
Uh, Cynthia, can you tell me who the chair of the DNC is? Never mind. Uh, uh, Tim, can, can, can you tell me who it is? Jane, can you tell me who it is? Uh, Never mind. I'm busy laughing. I'm Stop it. Face, but I can't see him. Okay, but my point is it has to be a leader. And I don't think that Joe Biden shares the stage enough. He should have his arm around this leader. He should have his arm around the next uh, Democratic candidate for president, too. That's, that's another that's another show. Um, but the point is, um, we need that kind of leadership from the Democratic Party. And that's my answer to your question. All right. And it's a good one. Thank you, Jay. Jane, your last thoughts on this topic. Um, what what do you think might be a solution here? Well, uh, I agree with Jay that you know there's probably not a lot of strong uh, leadership in the National Party. But I'm part of a project that, that, and, uh, that, that, that uh, the DNC is part of. And I think I'm one, I'm told I'm one of about 200 people in the state of Hawaii. And we've been doing these postcards. And I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that, actually. Right. So I'm on my sixth packet already of 50 cards. Uh, and, and, and now I'm sending postcards to Wisconsin, telling them, you know, to get out and register to vote. And, and and so, you know, this is a DNC program and it's going on in uh, all 50 states. And, and we've got 200 people in the state of Hawaii writing these postcards. And, you know, so that kind of gives me some hope that, you know, you know, that some of these postcards out of maybe the 300 postcards that I've written out, maybe if I can get 10 people to register to vote, I would have done my job. And if everybody else who's doing this you know, continues to, you know, and we've got, like I said, people in 50 states doing this. Hopefully, you know, we can overcome some of these voter suppression, you know, laws. You know, I have a couple of neighbors that are doing the exact same thing. And the comments they make is they get, um, they get feedback saying uh, from a household in Iowa, uh, how cool it is to get a postcard from Hawaii. So <laughs> it actually has a little bit of panache to it when it's uh, received in Iowa or Wisconsin or wherever. Yeah. All right, well, Jane, thank you very much for your last thoughts. Cynthia, uh, your thoughts, please. Jamie Harrison <laughs> is the head of the DNC. And I can't believe I couldn't come up with <laughs> the <before>. Thank <laughs> you. I'm glad we didn't end the show without knowing that. I knew it too, it was right on the tip of my tongue. Okay, so um, like Jay has said in many past shows, where are the lawyers? Where are the lawyers? I want them to flood the courts. That's again, my same thing. Okay, so my last thing is, our government is bold enough to force women to have a child they don't want, but too weak to ensure that they make it to recess alive. <clears throat> and I think that's just like, really says it. They're too weak to, to establish voting rights they're too weak to get gun control but boy they're strong enough to make sure you have a child you don't want all right you know thank you very much cynthia uh you know we have gone way over time and i'm in the hot seat right now so jay i hope you um are okay with that no i'm not i have to add one more point <laughs> i knew it <laughs> go ahead <laughs> it's not only voting it's sending money and uh, the, prob the problem is that, uh, you know, social media has not been kind to us and the, who knows what kind of players are behind it, but I get 500 crap email requests for money every day. Yep. And it goes back to your friend, Jamie Harrison. I remember that name. Um, you know, if the DNC would only tell me to whom I should send the money uh, so that I don't lose it, so it's not phishing, so it's not, you know, stealing my money or mis misguiding my money, I would send money. And there's a tremendous amount of money out there that's unspent because there's such confusion, which the DNC could resolve. And that money could change the result in the election. Money, sorry to say, you know, a great country buys votes. It buys TV media and all that. So <clears throat> we, we have to address that. DNC has to address that. All righty. Thank you, Jay. I'd like to thank our special guest, Jane Sugamora. I'd like to thank Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and of course, I have to thank Jay Fidel, my co-host, for American Issues Take One. Please join us next Wednesday, 11 o'clock. I'm Tim Apicelli. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and join us next week. Thank you.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.